I go meet Carrie for lunch with the kids and Chick-fil-A. And we're just sitting there chatting. And I've been gone now, separated for a couple months. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, the Holy Spirit just worked through Carrie. And she looked at me and says, you know, you know, you call yourself a Christian, but you look at the way you're living, right? And you know, look at the things you've done at, at church and, and all these things that you say. But she's like, I don't see it. She's like, I think if you die today, you go to hell because the way you're living and who and who you say, what you say you are and the way you're living are two different things. Hmm. And so she just laid it right to me. And at that point in time, I, I really couldn't talk. I mean, I was, nobody ever said that to me before. Welcome to Miracles from the Hill podcast, where we share raw stories that display the anatomy of God's grace here at Miracle Hill Ministries. If this is your first time joining us, please subscribe. And of course, you can like, comment, and leave a review. To connect with us, visit our website linked in the description box. And now, here is our host, Ryan Dirk. Greetings, listeners, and welcome to the Miracles from the Hill podcast. We are so excited that you're here with us today. Uh, we want to take a minute and thank you for being passionate about the things that we're passionate about and encourage you to leave us a, con a comment uh, about the content. I almost flipped those words back. Comment about the content. Please like and share so we can get, um, you know, the Lord's stories out to more people. And you can email us at podcast at miraclehill.org. We are just excited if you're new that you're checking us out and I encourage you to stick around. So today we're here with my buddy Aaron Cullop. Good morning, Aaron. Good morning. Good to see you. Um, so let me, uh, good to see you as well. Let me give a brief bio of Aaron. Aaron uh, lives with his wife Carrie and three children in Simpsonville. Holds a marketing degree from Bob Jones University and an MBA from Clemson University in Innovation. He is currently the director of North America and Canada for the research and learning business segment for Walters or Walters? Walters Kluwer. Walters Kluwer. Man, I would never have said that that way. Tax and accounting. <laughs> uh, <laughs> he's also an instructor for Clemson University, teaching business negotiations to graduate students and an instructor at Bob Jones University, teaching venture capital. Aaron and his family are members of Rocky Creek. Shout out to Rocky Creek in Greenville, where they're actively serving. And we have Aaron on here not to really talk about any of that. I know. <laughs> um, so we're going to talk about, you know, the story of God's grace in Aaron's own life. And we're going to kind of go off on a subject that we typically don't tackle here, mm -hmm. right? So, um, you know, typically our stories are about homelessness and addiction and ways those, um, you know, those two big kind of issues play out in today's world. But I had a mentor years ago who said that he believed that most people struggling with chemical addiction also struggled with sexual addiction or at the very least had an unhealthy relationship with sexuality. And so that is where we are going to be today and what we're going to talk about um, so thank you for your transparency. Thanks Absolutely. for being willing to be on here. And, uh, I'm excited to see where the Lord takes the conversation. So we're going to start out as we always do with, with God's grace in your own life. So where'd you grow up? Yeah. So I grew up in Northern Indiana in uh, Goshen, Indiana. It's right outside South Bend, uh, Indiana. So right off, uh, Lake Michigan. So that's one thing I don't miss Ryan is the lake effect snow. I'm sure you that, don't. That comes in the cold that goes with it. And uh, so, yeah, I was uh, born in the late 70s in, in that area and, um, and moved here in 1997 when I went to Bob Jones University and uh, never looked back as far as the weather's concerned. Uh, but all my family is uh, still up there. So mom and dad and my siblings have a brother and two sisters uh, still all live up in that area. And what was life, uh, family life like growing up? Yeah, great question. I grew up in a great home. Um, you know, I was, God was really good to me, uh, two Christian parents, still married, I think in 45 plus years. 
And um, so, you know, just had a, an amazing home, grew up in a great church. And my dad was always active in the church. He was a deacon. He was um, on all kinds of committees and you know, set a really good example for me. Uh, the way he treated my mom, I think I can only think of maybe even a couple of times or ever saw him even argue. So my mom and dad just provided this phenomenal Christian home mm -hmm. uh, for me to grow up in. Grew up in a Christian school, uh, 12 years at Elkhart Christian Academy. And um, so I was taught the Word of God, had Bible classes. So he had a really good foundational element in my head of, of who God is. And um, and so they just provided this great environment for me growing up. And growing up in this, um, it was it was a very structured environment, mm -hmm. school environment. And were you, uh, you know, there's kind of two flavors of this environment. There's the, the flavor that really does do a good job of shielding you from the world. And then there's the flavor that says they shield you from the world, but there's this huge undercurrent of the world kind of within the student body. So which one were you in? You know, I really was a good kid. I, you know, mom and dad, I mean, if you, you know, you look at it from a sheltering standpoint, um, and they really did provide a, a sheltering from the world, um, for me, which, which to be honest with you was a good thing for me. Um, you know, so just because when I got to college, you know, those, some of those curiosities kind of got the best of me, but I digress going back into, you know, growing up in high school. I mean, I never got involved with drugs or alcohol or sex or anything like that. Um, you know, our idea of having fun was playing basketball on the weekends. Mm -hmm. And so the Christian school that I went to, um, you know, was phenomenal for that, you know, making good Christian friends. There, there were, you know, obviously there were kids at any school, private or otherwise, that, that can get into trouble. Um, I never really was drawn to that crowd, and I guess they were never really drawn to me. I think primarily, Ryan, because I was never really that popular, you know, in high school. Um, you know, I was a skinny kid that played sports, and, you know, I just... You know, at that time where my personality had, you know, was at, I wasn't really confident, a real confident young guy. And uh, so, you know, I didn't have a lot of girlfriends and, you know, that type of thing. And it really wasn't that popular. So I guess I wasn't really pulled in by that crowd or sought after, mm -hmm. um, you know, and that uh, things changed when I got into college, but at least for me at that point. And so, you know, I just, um, for the most part, um, just, you know, had this really good life growing up and very conservative Christian home. So uh, you grew up in a conservative Christian home. You go to a conservative Christian school. Who was Jesus to you then? Was it a religious figure? Yeah. So, you know, for me, um, and I don't, I don't want to start Thunder for later, but, you know, at, at five in 1984, at five years old, made a profession. Mm -hmm. But I think that back then, you know, when you look at, and, and you see today even in some Baptist churches, you know, you know, I grew up in a, in a Baptist church, in a church where it was one, two, three, repeat after me, right? It was pray this prayer, and, and you're saved, and you're on your way to heaven. So February 14th, 1984, I remember praying that prayer with my dad, right? And so, you know, um, and I remember it like it was yesterday. So it was very clear in my mind mm -hmm. when that happened. And so I really hung my hat on that um, from a salvation standpoint. And then growing up, after I had made that profession— you know, I remember having emotional experiences, whether it was singing worship music, mm -hmm. you know, throughout youth group or in high school. And um, so, you know, I had a very good understanding of who Jesus is and what he does. And um, I, but however, you know, I think it did manifest in my life like it should have. So you uh, eventually finished high school and you come down to Bob Jones mm -hmm. and things shifted a little bit. Yeah, things shifted a lot. So, you know, moving down to South Carolina from Indiana and, and, you know, my parents dropped me off and after 30 days I was homesick as I'll get out. But, um, but, you know, that's where I kind of connected with some of the wrong friends, you know, at the university. And this would have been 1997. And uh, it really stirred a curiosity. The world, there was a curiosity factor there. So I found myself even my freshman year, you know, experimenting with, with different things. I have, you know, um, first time I ever smoked a cigarette and I didn't like it. Um, that's the only one I've ever had in my life, but, uh, <laughs> but it, yeah, I mean, I, you know, tried it and it was a menthol cigarette and that was the last one I ever had. But, you know, I just kept trying these different things, right. That, that friends would get me, went to a dance club, um, you know, and that was, you know, that was just eye opening to me. Um, you know, never had any alcohol until I was 21. You know, I experimented with that and, and, and became a social drinker when I was 21. But, you know, as far as when I was 19, 18, mm -hmm. 19 years old. Um, really got into that crowd and, and, um, 
you know, there was something intriguing to me about that because like I said, I never really got involved in that growing up. And I think that as my personality developed at that point in my life, as I had more confidence in myself and, you know, start, started getting into fitness and weight training, all of that. So it started affecting, you know, my confidence level and how mm -hmm. I felt my personality started being more uh, extroverted, you know, so people wanted to be around me and I was more included and asked to be included in those types of things. So there was still, so even like the menthol cigarette in, correct me if I'm wrong, but in the Bob Jones world, there's huge risk associated with that, right? Like you could get in big trouble. Yeah. For any of it, really. Yeah. I mean, at this time, you know, and I love Bob Jones University. I mean, you know, at this time, you know, the way the rules were structured, um, and I'm sure they're, they're very similar today, but you know, yeah, I mean, you, you didn't go to a movie theater, you didn't smoke a cigarette, you didn't go to a dance club. And you know, the goal of the university was uh, to be, you know, to be a believer, to act like mm -hmm. one. And, you know, and I knew that when I went to Bob Jones, I knew what I was getting into. Um, and, and other students do as well. Um, but I just chose to, you know, to violate those rules. And um, b because, because of the draw of the world in my life and the lack of, you know, Christ manifesting himself in my life and really being absent, you know, I was drawn and pulled by the world. So, uh, and you may not even know the answer to this question. So mm -hmm. you're, you're 18, 19 years old. You've grown up in this very specific kind of lifestyle. And then you start making some poor decisions. Mm -hmm. Decisions, I I'm assuming you knew that, that it was wrong. Yeah. How were you justifying that in your head? Or do you remember? Yeah, I mean, you know, for me, um, you know, God creates everybody with a conscience, even unbelievers, right? So I knew right from wrong because I'd been taught you know, growing up, um, you know, but I never, just never had any power in my life to overcome it. And, um, you know, so, you know, it was just one of those things where as I got more and more involved in sin, I just, you know, my conscience just started going away. You built up calluses. You, yeah. You built up calluses and, you know, and so it was just getting easier and easier and easier to do those things. And, you know, yeah, you can justify it in all different types of ways. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, uh, for me, I could justify and say, well, Hey, at least I'm not drinking alcohol or, you know, I'm not, you know, having fornication I'm not involved in, in sexual type things. And so, you know, I'm okay. Or it's, you know, it's just, it's just a little bit of dancing or what have you. Um, you know, so, I mean, it, you know, you, you begin to justify it, but what happens is when you do that is you get roped in a little bit tighter and you, you go down deeper and one sin leads to another. Now during college, do you meet your wife then, or do you meet her after college? I didn't meet her until uh, 2003. Okay. Uh, I, I take that back. Actually, um, we started dating in 2003. I met her in 2000. So, um, so what happened was, you know, my junior year of, of at Bob Jones University, um, I was dating a girl, and she was in Fountain Inn, lived in Fountain Inn, and um, so I ended up going to Pleasant Grove Baptist Church in Fountain Inn, and that's where I met Carrie, and she was dating someone else at the time. So we knew about each other. We'd met each other in, in 2000, um, but really didn't start dating until 2003 at Pleasant Grove Baptist Church. And I might add, Brian, I think it's relevant to the conversation that, you know, um, my lifestyle was continuing to take me downhill as such where, you know, one sin kind of spirals into another. And, you know, at, I was going to get married to a young lady at Bob Jones in 2000. I ended up breaking that engagement off didn't get married. So I, I couldn't go back to Bob Jones because I, I was a town student. I lived in town. Um, and, uh, I, ha I wasn't 23 years old. So you had to be 23 to be a single town student. So I broke off this, this engagement that I had to young ladies. So I was in town. I had a great job, um, as a sales supervisor worker at an MCI. And so that crowd that I was running with, and I'm 20, 21 years old, yeah. um, you know, we were working second shift. So we're working from two to 10 PM at 10 o'clock, we were heading over to Bailey's and we're heading over to game time and some of these other places. And, you know, that's where, you know, my life began to, I got involved in more things such as drinking more, being more social in my drinking, especially at first 21, after I started, you know, experimenting with that, you know, getting involved in, you know, sexual type activities, you know, with other ladies, with other girls. And, um, and so I was roped into a certain segment of people at where I worked. Mm -hmm. where it was like every night we were doing those types of things. And so, you know, my life began to continue to go downhill. Well, it caught up with me in 2003. Um, so it would have been January of 2003. You know, I'm in downtown Greenville, and there's a the radio station 98.1, um, you know, was going around doing pictures at pub crawls, and they caught up, got a picture of me with a couple of drinks in my hand. And obviously that got not a good thing as yeah. a, 
you know, so I had gone back to Bob Jones. Um, you know, I was over 23 at the time. I'd gone back to finish my degree. And so I was within a week of graduating and those pictures were discovered and, and I was let go from school. I wasn't able to graduate. So literally had my cap and gown in hand when they told mm-hmm. me that I wasn't going to be able to graduate. And I saw those pictures and, Hey, you know, you violated the rules, you know, and you, you, you don't, we don't do that here. And so that was God's way of trying to get my attention mm-hmm. at that point in time. And I continued to resist. Right. And so, you know, that was, it was May of 2003 and, at the time, I was still working at MCI, doing really well professionally, building a sales career, and boarded an airplane for the Philippines and flew over there for a month to do some project work for MCI and do some sales training over there. And then when I got back, that's when um, you know I, I reconnected with Carrie and we started dating. This has been in July of 2003. So um, I probably could just ask you this off air. So mm-hmm. when they stop you from graduating, they can't take your college credits. Right. So do you just not walk, but you still get the degree? No. How does so that I didn't, work? Yeah. I mean, the way that the way it was set up at the time was, um, no, I didn't get anything. So, you know, I had pretty much finished all the courses yeah. and everything. And, um, you know, it was, no, you can't, you can't finish. So I didn't, I didn't get a degree, didn't walk across the platform or anything. And, and which, you know, I completely understand. I mean, again, you know, Bob Jones University is, you know, got high standards and, you know, for the students that go there. And, um, and the rules, the rules, are the rules, and it's a Christian university that which, whose goal is to represent Christ. And, yeah. you know, when you're in the community and you are a student at Bob Jones university, but you're out drinking, I mean, that's not a, not a great representation of the university. So, you know, looking back on it, I get it. I mean, obviously as at the time I wasn't happy about it. Um, but I did it to myself, Yep. right? It's no fault of the school. The school is, you know, upholding its, its rules and code of conduct that I signed off on as a student. Yeah. Right. So at the end of the day, that's, you know, it, it was totally on me. Um, and, you know, I ended up going back to Bob Jones University in 2007 um, and finishing my degree. You know, I had to go back and, and retake two full time semesters. Um, really? I did. A whole year. A whole year. But you know what? It was great for me. And here's why it was more Bible training. Yeah. Okay. It was, you know, more business training, uh, especially in my minor field of administrative technology. I got to take more classes. But it was also the consequence of my sin. Right, a consequence of what I did, I broke the rules. So the the way the rules are stated is you got to come back for two 12 credit semesters. So I did it. I paid the price, and you know for breaking the rules. And as a result of that, I did. I I have more credit hours than most graduates at Bob Jones <laughs> University. I don't know, maybe 140 out of 123 that I was supposed to have. Um, but the way I look at it is more education, more training, and yeah. and it's it's the price I had to pay for, you know, for not following the rules and not living the life that I should have been for for Christ. So. I don't fault the university for that. I look at it as a positive. Yeah, you know, I don't know all the ins and outs of the history of Miracle Hill and its connection to Bob Jones, but today, man, we are so thankful for Bob Jones, for the volunteers, mm-hmm. the staff we get from there. Um, man, their their uh, professors are amazing. They help train some of our staff. Um, and, I, you know, the Bible says, give to Caesar what is Caesar's, um, unless what Caesar says violates the Bible. And... None of that. You may not like it, but if you agreed to it, none of it's asking you to do anything that's sinful. That's right. So that's right. Yeah. Um, okay. So you you meet Carrie. You guys get married at some point, um, and life just keeps moving forward. Yeah. So um, Carrie and I started dating in two thousand three, and um, really had a, a, a really good dating relationship. And you know, we dated a lot at her parents' house. I mean, a great way to date, right? At, and getting to know my future in-laws. And so, um, for a couple of years, we did that. I got married in 2006 and, um, in April of 2006, we got married. And, um, at that point in time, you know, my career was going through a bunch of different shifts. I was in banking and it really wasn't where I was supposed to be, um, in the banking world. I was, it was actually when we got married, I didn't even have a job. Um, it was in between banks at the time. Hmm. And, um, so, but six months after we got married, you know, we got, Carrie got pregnant with, um, our oldest son, uh, Colson. And so, you know, then within a year, year and a half, right. We, we've got a, we've got a baby. And I would say that, you know, at that point in time, you know, my life began to continue to start to spiral out of control. I really, you know, my wife had, um, postpartum depression. I didn't really know how to handle that very well. Uh, so after she had our son, um, I was very harsh with her 
And, 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 and Carrie was, was a believer and she is a believer. She got saved when she was 18. So it would have been, you know, probably around 96 or something like that, 98, somewhere in there, she got saved. Um, and, um, so, but she wasn't a very strong believer at that time, but she was a believer. And so, you know, within a year and a half, having a new baby, going back to Bob Jones to finish my degree. So 2007, 2008, you know, and I got out of banking and went to work for, you know, a company here in town in Greenville as a VP of sales. And my career was starting to take off, Ryan. And I started really focusing on that and I wasn't home very much. Um, I started up a fitness business on the side. So I was doing personal training. And um, so between that and my full-time job, um, I just really wasn't at home and, and Carrie stuck there with a, a new baby and, mm-hmm. you know, and, and so I didn't want to be, you know, around her at all at times because when I get home she was battling that postpartum depression. And, and so, you know, really it was mostly me just not knowing how to handle that. I just faced it by just not being at home and, um, and her, you know, figuring things out with, with Colson and how to make that work. And so it was very, very tough on her, but I just started really focusing on myself. And, um, and that's where, you know, my life really started to uh, continue to spiral out of control. I became more selfish, um, you know, to the point, uh, you know, 2009, you know, um, you got involved in another relationship, um, and was unfaithful to my wife and to my family and to my God. And, um, and that spanned for a few years. And, you know, looking back, um, at that time, you know, there was a lot of red flags. I didn't have any problem going to bed every night. I had no, no guilty conscience. Hmm. Right. I mean, so you're, you're in another relationship and you just, I slept fine every night. I didn't have any issues. And, you know, and his Carrie, Carrie, Carrie and I were struggling, um, you know, really, you know, and she doesn't know at this point. She doesn't know. Yeah. She, yeah. she I'm sure she suspected off and on throughout that period of time. Um, but, um, you know, I'm, I'm confident that she did, you know, but you know, for me, you know, I was moving away from Carrie and wanting to live my own life. And, um, in 2010, we had our, our daughter was born, uh, Carrie and I, we have a daughter who was born in 2010. So now I have two kids, but, you know, still in, involved in a relationship and doesn't honor the Lord. And, um, and so, and, you know, I just didn't want to be around Carrie. I didn't want to be with her at all. I wanted to be with this other person. And, um, and so, you know, um, claim the name of Christ though. So the, the interesting thing, I think it's relevant to the story was during this whole time, right. From the time I was married in 2006 up to this point, I'm highly involved at Pleasant Grove Baptist Church. So you talk about, you know, living, living two distinct lives, which we all struggle with, right? We all struggle with hypocrisy, even to this Mm -hmm. day, like we all battle sin. The difference for me was, is that I literally, literally was, you know, teaching a college and career class, singing in the choir, singing solos on Sunday, um, on the finance committee, Right. Um, I, I teach, I had all the head knowledge, like the Bible was in my brain. Like I knew it, you know, 14 semesters of Bible at Bob Jones university mm-hmm. and 12 years of private education and growing up in a Christian home, you really, you know, you, you get it down, right? Like you understand theology and doctrine. And so I was teaching on Wednesday nights, you know, Wednesday night services at Pleasant Grove Baptist church when the pastor was out, you know, I'd come in and step in and teach people. I led people to Christ. Albeit while, you know, throughout the week, I was living this different life. Okay, You're a so, double-minded man, unstable in all your yes, ways. Yes, double-minded. Eventually something has to give, right? Mm-hmm. You just can't. But I remember there's many a time I'd sit in church and want to, you know, and I'd just pray that prayer, like, you know, Lord, just save me, and nothing ever would change, you know? And um, a lot of it was I wasn't willing to give up the sin. I wasn't willing to give up that lifestyle. I loved it too much. You know, I loved um, what it represented. Can we yeah. pause on that? Yeah, go ahead. You loved what it represented. Mm-hmm. What did it represent? It represented freedom. me. Well, yeah, freedom. But you know, I was on the throne of my life, and it was me. It, re- it represented, you know, for me, I, I was only, I just, I, it was selfishness, you know, and pride. And you know, for me, it wasn't. You know, we, we were going to talk about you know sexual addiction and some of the things that we face. You know, when it comes to that, you know, for me, it was the chemical release that I had you know, from an emotional standpoint, you know, like there's a physical element to an affair for sure. But the emotional element is, you know, that the meeting, the needs emotionally made me feel good about myself. And, you know, it, it was things that where I didn't feel like Carrie was, you know, building me up or delivering. And I was getting that in other places, you know, that emotional build up to my ego. Right. And that was, you know, that that's kind of an addiction, a drug where, 
you know, you know, just you just feel so good about yourself. It kind of just pulls you in, and again, it becomes comes all about you. It became all about me at that point in my life, and so you know, living one way and, and talking about Christ, and then living the opposite way. Um, that was my life at that point, and um, you know, and so you know, it's amazing how God can still use you even when you're not in that place. And God used me, you know, for His purpose, but God also, God also broke me. So you, um, so if if you're not if somebody's listening to this and they can't see you, so Aaron's a fit guy, right? Generally a fit guy, but you were also at the same time you're a like obsessive gym rat, right? Yeah, like you're ripped. You're all about image. Uh, so it, was it was it about achievement? Like you wanted to be perceived a certain way and also achieve things that maybe were off limits that you could get away with. Do you, do you know like what the origin of kind of the, the, the trend of sin that's happening in your life? Yeah. I mean, if you look at my life at that point in time, you know, I was building a fitness business and I was on TV, right? Because, you know, um, I trained some of the TV um, journalists that were here locally in town and I was involved in the pageant system. So I was training a lot of young ladies that did, you know, Miss South Carolina and so forth. And, um, so being on TV, creating visibility, I was, you know, really good at business, right? And marketing and understanding how to brand myself. So I knew how to get myself out there locally in Greenville in the community. And that was, you know, through being on, you know, your Carolina and WYFF and some of those other channels to advertise my business, doing educational fitness segments. And, um, you know, so I did a lot of those at that time. And so I was in the public eye, you know, locally doing a lot of that, promoting my fitness business. And to promote a fitness business, you kind of have to be fit. Right, and you kind of have to look the part so that you're credible to the audience you're trying to reach. Unless you're Richard Simmons. Well, unless you're Richard, then you just Simmons. have to be energetic. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> you got a super amount of energy. Um, you know, so for me at that point in time, I was consumed with, from a vanity standpoint, the way I looked, um, and so I spent a lot of time, um, you know, exercising, working out, um, you know, doing uh, forms of steroids and stuff at that point in my life. And yeah, it was, you know, from a physique standpoint, you know, it was, it was an amazing time from a physique standpoint, Yeah, you know, because it was just all about me. And so everything mm. in my life at that, you know, revolved around, you know, me, my career, my fitness business, albeit I'm, I'm not at home. So I'm literally between working for the company I was working with here in town and doing my fitness business on the weekends, I have two small kids and a wife at home. And I, you know, and I'm involved in, you know, other types of another relationship and other things. And, you know, I was just never around. And during this time to kind of paint a picture of where, you know, my wife was at is she began to go closer to the Lord during that period of time. Like God began to continue to work on her. Hmm. And even though she was struggling, um, you know, she never, you know, went out and found another relationship or did anything else. She, you know, she stayed in it. And well, she did. She clung to Jesus. She clung that to Jesus. That was her relationship. Yeah, she clung to Jesus. She did. And she began to grow leaps and bounds um, during that, that stretch uh, because God knew what was to come. You know, so, so anyway, that, that time in my life was definitely, you know, like I said, it was just all about me. And I think that's, that's what we struggle with, right, is that it's, it's all about us. And, you know, in relationships, we make it all about us. And, you know, we're on the throne of our own lives. I have often heard, and I don't know this is true, I could go look it up, um, that in the Satanic Bible, they, there, there's commandments, like there is in our Bible, mm-hmm. and the first commandment of the Satanic Bible is, do what thou wilt, meaning do whatever is right in your own eyes. Yeah. And I don't know if that's true, uh, we'll, I'll look it up at some point, but the point is, Man, that's where we get to, right? Like we, uh, we outside of Jesus, we are chasing what we want. I love that you use the term vanity, um, and it just makes me think of Ecclesiastes, right? Vanity, vanity, chasing after the wind, uh, but we don't know it in that moment. We're yeah. just chasing what feels good in our flesh, right? Uh, people liking us, being perceived as important, looking physically. Mm-hmm. Uh, a- achieving through relationship, even you know if it's an extramarital affair, mm-hmm. all check marks on the "I'm great" and everybody else, you know, should worship me uh, checklist. So when does it come to a head? 
Well, you know, uh, I would say it's by the grace of God, right? I mean, salvation is, um, you know, just an amazing thing. And I think for me, you know, if I finally hit my low point, Ryan, in 2012. And that other relationship that I was in, you know, had taken a turn and that individual had moved in another direction and it, it, and it crushed me, you know, it was really, really hard for me. And so it's now, you know, spring of 2012 and, you know, so, and I'm, I don't really want to be married to my wife, right? I didn't really want to be there. And, um, and this other relationship had fallen apart. And so for that reason, you know, I was just in a bad spot. So I, you know, went and told my wife and, um, in May of 2012, and I told her that I had been seeing somebody else for a few years. I, I just opened up and told her and, you know, she didn't hit me across the face or swear at me or do anything like that. She, um, you know, she knew something was up. It, I think she was relieved, even though she was broken, I was sharing the news, but, but I separated from her. So I went and found my own apartment in town and said, you know, I just need a couple of months. That's kind of how I framed it. Just need a couple of months to kind of find myself and, I need to separate and I had no real intention of staying in that marriage, but I, I framed it as I just need a, a, a separation time and, you know, sleeping on an air mattress in an apartment, you know, I didn't have a lot of as much, that much money at that time. And, you know, in 2012 and, you know, Carrie was amazing in the sense that God really used her, you know, in May and June of that year, you know, where she never hit me, screamed at me, you know, cussed at me, anything like that. It was more of, Hey, listen, I know what you did. Um, Thank you for telling me, but come home, you know, we'll work it out. We'll go get counseling. We'll get help. And I was resistant to that. And that, that even those two months I was continuing just to, you know, find other things. Like I was empty on the inside, hmm. right? Cause I didn't have that relationship that I was in anymore. I didn't have a good marriage with Carrie. Right. And so I was still going out on the weekends and during the week and, you know, you know, having social drinking with my friends and going to the gym consumed with working out and, you know, building my training business still and just like life pressed on, but, but there was still an emptiness cause I didn't have, you know, a connection and a relationship anymore. And, um, you know, but I would still go over and see my kids once or twice a week and Carrie say, come on over, hang out with the kids. And I'd come over and she would pray for me, you know, and why, why I was there playing with the kids and, um, a lot of spiritual warfare going on. Mm -hmm. And, um, but I was definitely to a, getting to the end of myself, right. Where I was miserable. Um, I wasn't happy, didn't have anything, didn't have any money, didn't have anything. I was living in an apartment, like I said, in an air mattress and nothing was making me happy. Nothing was filling the void, hanging out with the friends that I had or going to the gym or the business, the fitness business, you know, having multiple Miss South Carolina winners, you know, all the success that I had in that business was still not filling that void. And then came the moment of truth in July of 2012. That's the Chick-fil-A story. Chick-fil-A story. Yeah. Yeah, so the moment of truth was, you know, 2012, it's it's July, and it's July 6th, right? And it's, um, you know, um, actually it was July 7th. It was a Saturday, and, and I go meet Carrie for lunch with the kids and Chick-fil-A. And we're just sitting there chatting. And I've been gone now, separated for a couple months. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, the Holy Spirit just worked through Carrie, and she looked at me and says, you know, you know, you call yourself a Christian, but you look at the way you're living. Right. And, you know, look at the things you've done at, at church and, and all these things that you say. But she's like, I don't see it. She's like, I think if you die today, you go to hell because the way you're living and who and who you say, what you say you are and the way you're living are two different things. Hmm. And so she just laid it right to me. And at that point in time, I, I really couldn't talk. I mean, I was nobody ever said that to me before, you know, because Ryan, for me, I remember praying the prayer in 1984 at five years old. So I always hung my hat on that fire, you know, fire insurance of, Hey, I remember the time and the place. And all you ever hear Baptist pastors say, if you remember the time and the place, you're good. Well, I, I believe that Satan used that as a deceptive tool for me, because even though I remember the time and the place where I prayed a prayer, okay, there was never a life change in my life. And I get it. I was five years old, but if you look at my high school and college years, you know, even though I was sheltered in high school, you know, I never, looking back, you can see it now. I never really had a, a true relationship with Jesus, you know, where I was just consumed with him and growing. And when I got into college, just, mm -hmm. you know, and through college and through my young adulthood, <clears throat> you know, I just didn't have, um, I could continue to live in sin and didn't have any guilt about it and had no remorse. And, and the Lord, and I just continued, and there was no chastening in my life of the Holy Spirit. I never was chastened. God never disciplined me. So all the classic symptoms of an unbeliever, and I knew it. So when Carrie 
had said that to me, the Holy Spirit began to draw me. And, and I felt the draw of the Holy Spirit. And that next 24 hours, I wrestled with God. So you talk about like Jacob wrestling mm-hmm. with God in the Old Testament. That was me. It was like I went back to my apartment. I left. I got up and left immediately. Didn't say goodbye to my kids. Just got up and left. Went back to my apartment. Wrestled with God for 24 hours. And um, then July 8th that, on a Sunday evening, um, at the age of 33, I remember just you know getting down on my knees and repenting and crying out to Holy God and saying, "Lord, I don't want to live this way anymore. You know, um, I don't deserve, I don't deserve you. I don't deserve to be saved. But God, I don't want to live, um, you know, in wrong relationships anymore. I don't want to, you know, be in the world and, and live this way. I'm just empty and I need you. And just crying and I could feel the weights come off, Ryan. And, and as I became a new creation, and I, I felt immediately different um, physically. Uh, I remember it like it was yesterday, even though it's been 10 years ago now, 10 and a half years ago. And um, so that very next day, um, you know, I, I called and left a message to the person that I had had a relationship with and let her know I was going back to my family, even though we weren't together. Because, I, you know, I, I just wanted to repent of all my sin. I wanted to renounce all of it. So I wanted people to know. So um, just started disconnecting myself with my old friends, you know, taking numbers out of phones, um, you know, immediately 180 degree turn, like didn't want anything to do with any of that. I was from a friendship standpoint and started to kind of block that off. And I was willing at that point, and that's how I knew it was real, Ryan, to move away from everything, mm-hmm. to literally go the other direction. And um, he went back home the very next day, went back home and told Carrie the decision I made. She, you know, embraced me and cried. And we, you know, obviously her parents were very skeptical at that point, but, um, you know, we, we began that road to recovery. And uh, so that started in 2012. But, you know, just because you, you get saved doesn't mean that your battle with sin stops. Right? So, sure. you know, it's, um, I, I tell people all the time and even now how God is using me now, you know, is in, in you know, when just recently I had a, a gentleman that I had talked to who gave his life to Christ at a Starbucks where we were at. And I never met the guy before, but our first meeting, you know, he gives his life to Christ and, you know, and I told him, I said, you know, just because you gave your life to Jesus today doesn't mean the battle with sin is over and doesn't mean that you're all of a sudden never, not going to struggle with this anymore. You know, it's going to be a constant battle. And, you know, for me, you know, in the, in, the, in the couple of years following, I still battled, you know, big time, really still battled the the sin of, you know, of, of not being faithful to my wife and, you know, had a, had a small relapse in 2014 and, um, you know, that, that I confessed and, um, you know, to my wife who was, who was amazing and gracious and, you know, and then we, we really connected. I think the mistakes that I made in 2012 after I got saved was I had no one really discipling me. Hmm. Even though I knew the word of God, Ryan, I, there was a lot of mistakes that I made. So, you know, good time to talk through those mistakes, right? You give your, your life to Jesus. Okay. I had no accountability in my life. Okay, so I didn't have any men surrounding me that were, you know, whether I didn't seek it out, I didn't really know to seek it out. Maybe I just didn't have any discipleship. It was a baby in Christ. Okay, and um, so didn't didn't really address my safeguards. Still continued to have my personal training business. Um, didn't shut it down, even though, you know, I had exposure to, to females and things of that nature. Um, you know, still went to a, a public gym. I mean, just environments where, as Romans thirteen fourteen says, make no provisions for the flesh. Even as a new believer in Christ, I was not making, I was still making provisions for my flesh. Sure. Right. And I saw myself grow. Um, I was in God's word. I was listening to podcasts. I was reading God's word, but it was very small incremental growth, but there was growth. And, and I still, I, and I felt bad when I sinned. And I would say that, you know, when I had a, a small relapse, um, in a relationship that I shouldn't have been in. It was for a short period of time. I felt terrible. And I couldn't sleep at night. And I was miserable. Completely unlike the relationship I had before, mm-hmm. right, where I slept fine every night and I had no guilt. No, this time God brought me to the end of myself. It was only a three, four-month period of time. And, you know, and I just rep- I just wanted to repent and move away from it. And um, even though Carrie and I's relationship, you know, still had not fully recovered and was not and it's still in that good of a spot, a couple of years later, I, I went, I was not caught. I went repented of my sin. I confessed my sin outright. Um, and that was one of the biggest evidences I knew that I was a believer is that I didn't get caught. It wasn't a worldly sorrow. It was a godly sorrow. It was like, okay, I'm a Christian and I'm not supposed to do this. Mm-hmm. 
you know, this doesn't feel right. I'm miserable. And even if I lose everything I have, I'm going to profess the name of Christ and I'm going to do right. I'm going to be, you know, the, if, I, if, if I'm divorced, I'm going to be the best Christian single father I can possibly be if that's what happens, right? But I'm just going to do what's right. And so, you know, that at that point um, from 2014, late 2014 on, early 2015, you know, um, we got involved with um, Open Door Biblical Counseling and Steve Ellis, a plug and shout out to him. And Steve is uh, a very dear friend of mine now. And Carrie and I started trying to pick up the pieces of a, you know, a broken marriage and three years of marriage counseling, a really intensive marriage counseling. And arguably, um, maybe even broken based on what you're saying isn't the right word. Maybe the right word is a new marriage, Mm -hmm. right? So like Mm -hmm. now you're spiritually equally yoked. Yeah. Uh, Now you maybe understand it in a real way, the biblical mandate to chase your wife and love her like Christ loved the church. And if if you were doing you when you guys got married, then, you know, you weren't really ever chasing your wife. So now you're learning to chase your wife for the first time. So you, you did counseling with Steve. Yeah, so, so there's a lot of things that I did to take you into that time. I mean, you know, I didn't know what love was. You know, I mean, my, you know, as an, again, a new believer, a couple of years, you know, coming out of, you know, um, another incident where, you know, I was, I had sinned. And so, but God started working on me and, you know, in revealing things to me that I needed to do to protect my heart, protect my marriage. And I didn't know how to love Carrie. Um, you know, in some ways, Carrie would tell you she didn't know how to love me. I mean, there was, you know, we were, we were just, we're not in a good, good spot. And um, so going through that counseling, but I, not only in the counseling, I realized that I had to do more things to, to live a victorious life. And, and, and it's still not perfect, right? You know, we, we still fight and battle sin, you know, even to this day, right? Like the fight is on every day. But, but what I realized is, is that I started removing things in my life that brought temptation into my life. Mm-hmm. So I got off Facebook, right? So I took down, you know, all my, all my fitness videos. I think there's only one left online. Um, you know, so that's gone. Um, the only social media platform I have is LinkedIn, but outside of that, I took down, you know, Facebook, um, YouTube, just got off all of that because it's, it's just too much temptation. And I, I took down all those videos that projected me, right. I just wanted to strip that down. So, you know, started some cleanup there. Um, I built an accountability circle around me of five different men, um, including my father, my father-in-law and, um, uh, a former boss of mine, uh, Paul Garrigan, who's a dear friend, and um, Gene Merkel, who's a faculty member at BJU, who invested in me when I was 18 and never stopped. Um, we still have lunch every three to six months uh, together, and then Steve Ellis. And I've act- actually added a couple of more over the last couple of years mm-hmm. um, that you know have made it into that circle. And accountability isn't them checking on me. Accountability is me going to them. And so what I, you know, even to this day with those men, I, I always go to them. If, if I screw it up or I mess up or I'm prideful or my priorities are wrong or, you know, you know, I, I do something to upset Carrie or whatever, I, I confess my sin. Because James 5.16 says, confess your sins one to another so you can be healed, right? So, you know, there's a difference in First John 1 John 1.9, right, or other scripture verses where, you know, when you confess your sin, God will forgive you. But to find healing, you need to confess it one to another. And that's the hardest thing to do. And so having those accountability men in my life, I can go to them. And when I screw up, I can say, hey, you know, I missed the boat here this week. Or I did this or I said this or I got angry and I shouldn't have. And, I, and it feels really good to get that out. And, and it's at that layer of accountability, you know, versus them chasing me and saying, hey, how'd you do this week? No, it's me going to them and saying, this is how I did this week. Well, this it can't be an, an effectual and fervent prayer if, if they got to yank it out of you. That's right. right? That's you right. got to confess it so that they know exactly what to pray for, um, and they can continuously do that on your behalf. Yeah, I mean, and it, and I do the same for them, um, you know. And so you you got to surround yourself with accountability. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, I just went to some extreme safeguarding. So, you know, for me, I was you know in sales and you know working for a company out of Atlanta. I was traveling a lot during that time. My career was taking off. God was you know certainly blessing me again. And you know, so I did very little overnight travel. Um, you know, I did a lot of day trips so that I wasn't, you know, in environments where I'm staying overnight by myself in hotel rooms. So, you know, for me, that was driving to Jacksonville and back same day or, you know, Memphis and back or Tampa and back same day, like just ridiculous. Like you would never think I look back and I don't even know how I did that physically, Mm -hmm. but God sustained me and I was able to go and do those things. 
And it just didn't expose me to temptation of being, you know, a businessman out there in hotel rooms, you know, where I can fall into t- t- traps and temptation because I knew that, you know, even as a believer, you know, it only, you know, I didn't want to fall back into it again. So, and you still do that to this day, correct? I do. Like if you have to go somewhere, yeah. you take somebody with you or you're driving 20 hours in a day. Yeah. Yeah. I just recently made a trip and um, my mom and dad were there, right? So, you know, spent when I wasn't, um, you know, working at that convention was spending time with my parents and, you know, so, and, and you know, did Phoenix a few months ago and had another friend of mine from Atlanta uh, and he and I hung out together. So, you know, there, there's accountability that I really try to set up, you know, for myself. And, and I believe that that's important because Ryan, honestly, I don't trust myself. Well, you shouldn't. No. I mean, it's, <laughs> it's one of those things where, you know, one of the things you learn in marriage counseling that's really effective is Carrie will never trust me ever again. And that's okay. I'm good with that. But the difference is she trusts God with me. Right. Cause, because when you're somebody like me, you know, she has that, that past always, that shadow is always there. Right. So the hurt and the pain that she has to deal with for the rest of her life is always there. Okay. And so, you know, I, I, I have to trust God as well with Carrie that she'll forgive me, that she'll stay in a mode of forgiveness that, you know, so you, you got to trust God with each other. Um, but for me, yeah, I mean, I know my flesh and that old man is still there and the devil's still trying to trip me up, Ryan. And the battle is very real. And, you know, I think we all, you know, as men, we all face that battle, that temptation. And even now, you know, when you, you feel yourself veering off that path, you know, God's been gracious enough to, to kind of poke and say, listen, if you go down this road, um, you know, it's going to happen. It's going to be a, it's going to be a bad deal. Right. So when you start entertaining sin, you do immediately go the other direction. You're like, all right, I know where this is going to go. And you repent of the thought process, the thoughts and everything. And you move in another direction. And, you know, but I think the, the thing for me is, you know, is the safeguarding myself as insulating myself as much as I can. And I have people say, I can't believe you live that way. Like, you know, I don't get out of my house much and I'm okay with that. And well, you're living in a prison. No, I'm actually more free than I've ever been. Right. Because, you know, I, but I live by a certain safeguards. I don't go to a public gym anymore. You know, gave that up because I can't handle that environment. And I'm not afraid to say that, you know? No, and that is, you know, the, I believe that what you're landing on is the key to sanctification, right? So mm-hmm. it is it is understanding that the heart is deceitfully wicked above all things, right? right? Like that we are broken. And so recovery or change or sanctification is not about us being good. It's about us getting out of God's way and Jesus being good in our life. Um, one of the aha moments that I had in my own recovery was, uh, and this was very tough, was coming to the recognition that if I want to chase Jesus and stay sober, that for the rest of my life, I can't live alone. And as a, as a man, Mm -hmm. you know, I want to be self-sufficient and take care of things. And this is before marriage and be able to provide for myself, but I know that when I'm alone is when I let the flesh do what the flesh wants to do. It's yeah. the perception of freedom that causes me to make really poor decisions. And so it's the accountability piece. If I really want to chase Jesus, I don't need to put myself in that situation where I have the freedom to make the poor choice. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so all these years, I've never lived alone. I mean, I went from being in recovery to living in a transitional house to living in an apartment with some guys to living in a house with a guy to a house with my wife. Yeah. Right. Yep. And, uh, you know, that that'll be the rest of my days and I've, I've made peace with it. Um, but it is the recognition of my own brokenness, not the recognition of my own healing. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, yeah. okay. So at some point the Lord uses your story and kind of calls you to minister to other people that other men that struggle um and in all different types of way but certainly he's used you uh with healing where there's where there's sexual brokenness whether that be affairs or pornography or things like that so i want to shift our focus Mm -hmm. to that subject we'll still talk pieces about your story um uh, so how would you define, uh, and, and I have no idea how you're going to answer these questions. So how would you define sexual addiction? Uh, I think it's a pretty broad area. 
I mean, and, <clears throat> you know, for me, you know, um, I think the toughest part is, you know, the pornography thing, you know, for me was never uh, an issue. And I say that knowing full well that, you know, the, the devil attempts and it can attack me in that area. And so I don't want to say that from a proud perspective. I say that because that, that particular sin never made sense to me. You know, uh, for me, it was always, I'd just rather have a real relationship, you know, and, and, and get my satisfaction from a, from a real standpoint, not in some kind of fantasy land. So, you know, that's always been, and it's, sometimes I think that's the problem when it comes to sexual addiction is some, you just sometimes you don't understand each other's sins. There's a difference between infidelity and pornography and the different types of sins. And so I think it's a broad term from a sexual addiction standpoint. It can encompass um, pornography. It can certainly matter with lust, right? And, you know, that type of thing. And, you know, the way your, your, your brain is wired and the lust that's there, certainly you have, you know, infidelity, fornication, you know, sex prior to marriage. You know, you have all, so I think it's a, a really broad term of what it encompasses. And um, you, you have homosexuality for some people, right? So there's so much to unpack there. I think it's more common today for men and from a secretive standpoint with pornography mm-hmm. and especially a lot of married men, but men in general. Um, you know, I saw a statistic recently, I don't remember where I saw, but 70% of even Christian men battle with pornography. Yeah, I'm going to give a whole bunch of stats. So that's you, what, yeah, you'll be the that's statistician. One of the, and you that's can, one of the stats that I've got. Yeah. So the, um, the definition that I use for lust is an overpowering desire for anything, right? So it, at some level, it's idolatry, mm-hmm. right? So whatever we are yearning for, that overpowers us uh, from a decision-making standpoint. And so where infidelity and pornography uh, seem very different, uh, they're both about a chase, mm-hmm. right? You're chasing yeah. chasing something that you desire, Um accomplishing it knowing that it is wrong uh, if you're a believer and then having some type of um if you go physiologically having a dopamine release yeah. as a yeah. result right like yeah. so at, at its base um pornography infidelity and crack cocaine are no different in the brain right like you're you're chasing something mm-hmm. that's releasing a chemical in your brain and helping you to feel good yeah, I think that that's there's there's this the where this where they're synonymous, right? Yep. Between you know being in a sexual relationship and uh, with somebody that's not your wife, um, whether it's before marriage, after marriage, and pornography. There's the the kind of link. It, it, there is a and I remember that feeling. There is a feeling of euphoric feeling that you get when you know that person of the opposite sex. You know, from an, even from an emotional standpoint, builds you up you know, um, you know, says things to you, makes you feel like a million dollars and, um, you feel that dopamine release in your brain. And, and, you, and it could be a woman. It could be pornography. It could be, it could be drugs. It could be food. It, yeah. It, it could, could be, be food. Yeah. You fill in the blank yep. social media, yep. right? Like there is a, there's a whole growing field of, of learning how social media becomes an addiction from the same root, right? Yes. Uh, idolatry, Dopamine release from a chase of and achieving something that you know that right. is uh, in your mind might be good for you, although it may not be in real life. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And I think that you know the toughest part is at that point when you have that feeling, right, is to to bring the Lord into that battle. And um, you know, so but yeah, I think that that is the addiction, right? So you know, no marriage counselor, um, not the one that I use, but a different one that goes to our church who who said that that they've done. You know, brain scans and not seeing a difference between a cocaine addict and a, mm-hmm. and a pornography addict, right? That there's a lot of similarities in the way that those brains are firing, and so and there's a lot of neuroscience and stuff on that as well. But yes, it's sexual addiction is a is a problem that you know um, men struggle with. Oh. And, you know, pastors, deacons. I mean, it's you know, it's it's an epidemic proportions, and you know, I, I face a temptation every day, Ryan. I mean, there it's just out in front of you. You know, even though I have all these safeguards built in, all of us as men have that temptation to lust and to fall, you know, back into that kind of stuff. And so it's just, it's, it's a constant bombardment. So uh, let's talk about the constant bombardment. So mm-hmm. I'm going to, here's where I'm going to share a bunch of statistics, some of which okay. should be um, shocking. So uh, more than 40 million Americans, regular visitors to porn sites, uh, that's daily. Uh, there are 42 million porn sites totaling about 370 million pages of pornography. The porn's industry annual revenue is more than the NFL, NBA, and MLB combined. Let me say that again. I was shocked. Yeah. 
the porn industry's revenue is more than the NFL, NBA, and Major League Baseball combined. Uh, it's more than the combined revenues of ABC, CBS, and NBC. 47% of families in the United States reported that pornography is a problem in their home. Um, pornography use increases the marital infidelity rate by the more than 300%. And I want to pause on that and say this. Yeah. So, you know, um, we, we're about the same age, grew up in mm -hmm. the 80s. Mm -hmm. And back in the 80s, if you were a, a young person trying to find pornography, then you had to steal a magazine from somebody did. and go hide it in the woods. And that became like a, you know, a golden calf that all the boys in the neighborhood, I'm, I'm really just telling my own story, yeah. that would go out and, you know, to this, this secret spot where there was, you know, a Playboy magazine. Today, pornography is one second away from every human being because of the internet. Uh, it yeah. has shifted the the game and the availability if somebody is struggling in this area. Mm -hmm. uh, 11 is the average age that a child is first exposed to porn, and 94% of children will see porn by the age of 14. So 94% of children will see porn by the age of 14, which means nobody's kids are exempt. Right? That is yeah. the vast majority of children. 70% uh, of Christian youth pastors report that they have at least one teen come to, for, to them for help in dealing with pornography in the last year. 68% of church-going men and more than 50% of pastors view porn on a regular basis. Of young Christian adults, 18 to 24 year old, years old, 76% actively search for porn. Uh, I'll add to this that it is the thing that is taking out more pastors than anything else is pornography and sexual addiction. 59% um, of pastors said married men seek their help for porn use. 33% of women age 25 and under search for porn at least once a month. 13% uh, Only 13% of self-identified Christian women say they never watch porn. 55% of married men and 25% of married women say they watch porn at least once a month. Um, that is including the church, right? That is all marriages. 57% mm -hmm. um, of pastors say porn addiction is the most damaging issue in their congregation, and 69% say porn has adversely impacted the church. Only 7% of pastors say their church has a program to help people struggling with pornography. All right, yeah. million-dollar question. Mm -hmm. Why has this become such a huge issue in the church, and what are we doing wrong? Yeah, well, so the answer to the question is right in front of our noses. You brought it up. First thing is the access to sin. So, you know, I mean, I talk to guys all the time that you, know, you have a phone, you have a safari, you have an internet, okay, and your access to it is immediate. And, you know, I think that most individuals who struggle with porn aren't willing to go. You know, we talked about safeguards earlier. Mm -hmm. They're not willing to go to the furthest extent to protect their minds. So, you know, you talk with somebody who struggles with a porn addiction and you say, okay, hey, you know, can I have your phone and turn off your safari or can I put something on your phone to track it? You know, why do you need, why do you need to do that? Right? They're not serious enough about the sin, right, to, to do something about it. And, and I think that's the first you know, problem that we have is that, again, you love, you love your sin, right? You love the way it makes you feel. It's secret. You know, there's a lot of justifications for porn, you know, in a marriage, in a church. A lot of marriages are sexless. So it's like, it's a, it's a fill in the gap. It's a stand in the gap, you know, piece. Um, what, let's talk about a little bit, Ryan, and, you know, I think it's a good point to, time to go there, which is, you know, what pornography really, really, pornography does to the male mind. And, you know, and, I, and I've done some studies on it. And been researching it. There's a great book out there called Sex, Man, and God by Dr. Weiss, who, you know, is a Christian sex therapist who really unpacks this a little bit. And I've gone through this book with several guys to try to understand the way your mind works and your neurons and your neuronic pathways in your brain. The more pornography you see starting at a young age, you know, especially for teenagers, you develop a wrong view of women. They become objects of your satisfaction, source of your satisfaction. And they're not people. And you lose that. So when, when you get married, or you get in a relationship, okay, you, that's why you want to take, take, take from your spouse, okay, or, you know, um, 
and you're not you're not really concerned about giving to them and you know giving them satisfaction it's all really about your satisfaction and if they're not going to give you satisfaction then you'll go watch pornography and satisfy yourself so you know that that's really it's an objectification of women that happens it breaks down um, in your brain those neural pathways that you that God intended to, for you to have with your wife and and you again you just look at them as as a mere object so you see that happening um, where men just objectify women and that's what they are and you know and women can do the same thing you know for men you know where it's just a source it can go that way as well it goes both ways but 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 yeah in churches today I think you have that I think you have that you know, by the way, here's another thing I, I you got to mention. Not everybody in church is a Christian. So, you know, I, I think we forget about that sometimes. You know, the Bible says that, you know, that the road is narrow. Mm-hmm. Okay. And, you know, that the that the way to salvation, that, that there's a broad road and a narrow road, right? Well, if we're looking at percentages, I think we can um, pretty much conclude that that doesn't mean it's a 50-50% chance, right? Because if you have a broad and a narrow road, that means we're probably talking more like, you know, 80%, 90% of people aren't believers, and 5 or 10% of people that live on the earth are. Like, I'm speculating. Billy but, Graham, the greatest evangelist of, right? of the 20th century, said 75% aren't. Okay. He used the parable of the sower. Fine. So say 75, 80, 85, I would subscribe it's probably 90%. I, I think that it this, the gift of salvation is free, but it's hard to accept it because you got to give up all your sin and repent of it. That's hard to do. Gift is easy to take. It's hard to do, though. Right, and so most people don't want to give up their sin. They're not willing to do that, and you know. So at the end of the day, when you're in churches, you got to remember that a lot of the people you're shaking hands with on a Sunday. Remember, I was one of them. Remember, I was the Sunday school teacher, mm-hmm. the choir singer, played Jesus in the you know Easter drama. Like I was that guy that everybody thought was a believer, and when I got saved and went down in front of my church and said, "By the way, I had you all fooled. I just gave my life to Jesus last week," and you could have heard a pin drop in there in front of 600 people. Like I just, you know, came out with it. Like there is a lot of deacons and, and pastors even and people that if the Lord were to come today will be left behind. And they have everybody fooled because you have another life. You have a secret pornography life. You have whatever. But but I think First John is really clear. And, and let's even use Romans 6 verses 1 and 2. Like how can we who are dead to sin, Paul says, still live in it? Right? So if, if you're living in a state of, of constant sin, yeah, we all fight sin. I fight sin all the time. And, you know, and I have to repent and move, move away, right? No matter what it is, sometimes it's my pride, you know, and, and, I, and I confess that to my wife and, you know, my selfishness and you confess it to God and, and you got to move in and go back the other direction. And, you know, but unbelievers, you know, they, they still live in that constant state of sin. So you, you think the first biggest issue in this dilemma is an evangelism issue? I do. And I've experienced that over the last four years. God's really been using me over the last four years, right? Um, you know, so I think for me, I, you know, as Carrie and I went through marriage counseling, there had to be a growth period for me and a lot of growing to do. And not only from a marital standpoint to learn how to be a husband and a father, because I really didn't know how to do that. Um, so, you know, now it's, it's to a point where God's like, okay, I can, you know, really want to use you. And so God brought people to me and mostly men, you know, who went through what I had been through. And, um, and so being able to reach in their lives, what I've discovered is that, and a lot of them just didn't know Christ, even to the, the story I mentioned recently about a gentleman a few weeks ago who, you know, thought he was a believer and just really wasn't. And how do we unpack that? How do we get to that conclusion? I think we just opened up God's word. It wasn't me telling them that they weren't saved. It was me saying, let's look at First John chapter 1, chapter 2, and chapter 3. And John wants you, the, God wants you to know if you're saved. Okay, so if you're not gaining victory over your pornography addiction, first question you should be asking is, am I a true believer? Right? Am I fighting this at all, or am I just enjoying it and sitting back? Do I have any guilt? Well, when you read 1 John chapters and, 1, and, 2, and And if 3, it's guilt, is it worldly guilt correct. versus godly sorrow, right? Yeah. Is there yeah. is there this deep desire? Are you miserable? Like, are you, you Do you want to just come out and repent and get right with God? Or are you just in this, and you continue to live in it year after year after year after year? Right. So the Bible tells you how to know that you be free of sexual addiction, first by making sure you're a believer so you have the power to overcome it, right? And, and John talks about that this is how you know him, right? That you walk in his commandments, right? That you walk in obedience, that you love one another, that you love people, right? Not perfectly. None of us are perfect in our obedience, right? We all screw up all the time. We all battle with sin. But, but over, if I look at my last 10 years as a believer, I see this, this trajectory of going upwards. Like I have trip-ups along the way, 
but I keep moving forward and I keep getting closer to God and closer to God, and closer to God. There's sanctification happening in my life. And, you know, there's, a, there's an obedience. It's not perfect, but it's an increasing obedience. Okay, if you're not living in obedience in your life, red flags should abound. Like, it, you know, it's like, holy cow, like I'm really struggling with this and, you know, I'm not getting victory. Hmm. You know, and John really walks you through. He also says in there, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love of the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Do you love your pornography addiction more than you love Jesus? Okay, okay, well, that's First John, you know, chapter 2, right, as we get into that. You're loving the world. The love of the Father is not in you. Okay, so, you know, if you're not keeping the Lord's commandments and you're loving the world and you're not loving people, right, those are three areas right there. And even in chapter 1, it says, if you, th- if you say you're walking in light, but you walk in darkness, you're lying to yourself. And you're telling yourself the truth. Going back to that hypocritical thing. So if you tell everybody you're a believer... But behind the scenes, you're living in a sexual addiction or pornography addiction, or you're living in infidelity. Okay, behind the scenes, then you have to examine: Are you really a believer? And the the goal of this is not to get you know to cause a bunch of people to doubt their salvation as much as the Bible says to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. And when people come to me, the first tar- area of target that I go after is not their broken marriage that they're in, or their life being broken with pornography. I first address their heart with God and say. How do you, you know, how do you know if you die today, you're going to heaven? I mean, you know, what evidence is there that I could accuse you of being a Christian? So, so what if the person's response is, um, I know I'm, I know I'm a believer, mm-hmm. uh, uh, but I fit into the chief of sinners category with Paul. Well, I mean, it, it, for the the next question would be, well, how do you know you're a believer, right? I mean, again, you're saying that you are, but unpack that for me, right? If I look at the last six months of your life, okay. What, what fruit would I see, and why would I see that? Okay, you know, how are you, are you fighting the sin? How are you fighting the sin? What safeguards do you have in your life? Um, are you willing to put safeguards into your life? Um, are you willing to confess your sin and repent of it? You're not? Why not? Okay, so there's a, you got to go deeper. you got to really sit down and unpack that and really help them understand where their heart is, and then you got to open the Scriptures and let the Word of God speak to them. Because you're not going to save them. I'm not going to save them, right? It's, it's the Holy Spirit that does it. So once you bring open that scripture, and I always go to Romans 6, 1 and 2. I always go to 1 John chapters 1, 2, and 3. And boy, that's just a great place to start, right? Romans 13, 14, about making provisions for your flesh, right? You tackle that, and you say, all right, you know, based on scripture, would you pass the smell test based on what 1 John 1, 2, and 3 says, are you increasingly being more obedient? Are you increasingly loving people? And are you not loving the world? Okay, are all those things evident in your life? And well, no, based on this, what the Bible says here, I, I, don't, I don't believe that I am. Okay, I'm not saying you're not saved. I'm just saying that what the Bible says here, you, know, we, you probably have some concerns. And I think that we need to address where your heart is with Jesus right now before we can get into overcoming this sin because without the power of the Holy Spirit, you, you and I just aren't powerful enough to overcome the addiction. Like It's like beating your head against a brick wall. I don't remember how it was. right? As an unbeliever in those couple months I was separated in 2012, mm-hmm. I could not get victory over my sin. I just didn't have any power to do it, and you just keep falling back into it. So, um, okay, th- that's a good word. So uh, either the person um, comes to faith or it's clear that they are a person of faith, then, you know, what's the checklist? What do they need to do? What needs to change in their life relationally, mentally, emotionally, spiritually yeah. for them to, uh, you know, let Jesus take control and find freedom in this area? Well, the first thing you got to do is cut the access to sin, right? So it's it's hard going cold turkey, but you got to do it, okay? And so, you know, when it comes to that, you know, so in the instance of pornography, you know, it's it's taking the as far as if your phone, putting covenant eyes on your phone, or you know, locking down the access. So your computers, your apps. Um, you know, listen when it when it comes to sexual addiction, even pornography. I mean, there's just certain things that a lot of guys can't do. Some can, I know some guys that they want to go to the beach, right? There's there's a safeguard. Um, you know, so the environments that you put yourself in. You know, you just lock all that down. That's rule number one. And then you immediately, number two, is that accountability in that mix of men. Um, and like I said, I have five. I've actually added a couple more, you know, who are just very real with each other, mm-hmm. right, on a regular basis. And so you're surrounding yourself with accountability and you're locking down all access. And then the third thing is Romans 13, 14 says is, you know, make no provisions for your flesh. 
kind of goes a little bit with number one, but don't put yourself in environments where you might even struggle with lust. You know, you gotta be, again, doesn't mean you'd, you'd never leave your house. It just means like for me, I'm probably not going to go to a public gym where, you know, I'm probably going to battle with lust and temptation. Probably doesn't make a lot of sense for me to do that. You so, work out in your garage. Correct? So I work out my garage, right? I have since, you know, December of 2014, right? Just, it's just, it just moved in, repent, move in the other direction. So, you know, uh, in chemical recovery perspective, we, we talk a lot about people, places, and things, which is what you're hitting on, right? Like you got to change the people, change the places and change the things. Um, if somebody's not familiar with covenant eyes, it's an accountability software, mm -hmm. right? So it's the idea that, uh, a person puts covenant eyes on their phone and then they designate a human being that then has access to see everything that they view. Um, one of the points you made an hour ago was about accountability being something that you do, right? Which is, um, you know, I would say accountability is a two way street, yeah. right? Like it's about two individuals holding each other accountable mm -hmm. and even covenant eyes, which is a great piece of software is only as good as somebody's willing to use it. Right. So yeah. if they have their, they have covenant eyes on their cell phone, but they got this iPad over here that they're, um, you know, doing something on, or they have covenant eyes on their cell phone, but they're going to the, the, the beach or wherever to get their fix of, of looking at the opposite sex or whatever the case may be. Um, that accountability is only as good as they're willing to pursue it in right. their own life, which certainly um, shifts things. You mentioned filling their, life with God's word. So, uh, go deeper on that. Like mm -hmm. spiritually, what needs to change? Yeah. So, I mean, it's funny how, you know, again, most Christians don't even read their Bibles. Right. And, and I get it. It can become a checkbox for some people because there's parts of the Bible that are hard to read and, you know, you need to get your Bible commentary to unpack it, but you got to get into God's word because God's word is what changes you. And it's, it's, it's the biggest reason. I, you know, I'll, I'll say this. Up until two years ago, Ryan, I never read through the whole Bible. So I took it upon myself in 2021, and this is 2022. So, you know, this is the second year where I've been able to read it all the way through. Um, I've actually read every word that God put in the, the Scripture, and it's amazing the, the, the difference. You know, and in years past, I've read the Bible, but I just, you know, you read a book here, you read a book there, and I've, I've read it and grow, but really reading through cover to cover, understanding what God says and putting it all in perspective. And I've grown tremendously because of that. So, you know, to me, with some of the guys that I talk to now, it's, you know, it's journaling. So um, I have 10 years worth of journals in my safe, like manual, like handwriting. So when I read God's word, I write it down and I journal. I journal my life. Um, all through the, the rough periods of my marriage are all documented. Okay. And you know, my wife respects my privacy. Those are all in a safe, but something ever happens to me one day, my kids are going to read about my battle with sin and the struggles that I have with temptation and things that they're going to read about that. And the daily, you know, going through God's word and unpacking things. And I wrote my prayers down and, you know, I wrote letters to my kids in those diaries and those journals. Like there's just so much, you know, meat in there. Um, and so I think journaling is great and really writing down an application. So again, a lot of people read God's word and they just observe. Like, this is what it says, but they don't try to interpret it. Like, this is what it means, and then they don't apply it. This is how it can change my life, right? And we have a lot of observation teaching out there now from pastors and teachers. When you read God's Word, you got to unpack it. you gotta, you got to slow down. Don't just move through it in 10 minutes and say, I'm done for the day. Get a good study Bible, get a commentary, and read it and understand it, right? What is this saying to you? I don't care if it's in the book of Micah, which is where I read today in my devotions and in Revelation chapters 10 and 11, which is what I read this morning, right? It's like, what does this mean? You know, and then how does it change my life? Okay, so God's judging Israel, Ryan, right, and Micah, and it's not just Israel, it's Judah, right? So what does that mean for me? Well, their idolatry and their pride and their false prophets and all of that led them to the point where God just said, I'm going to judge you. Well, the application for me is if I choose to live in sin, unrepented sin where I just continue to let it go, eventually God's going to judge me. Eventually he is going to, as Hebrews 12 would say, I'm going to have the consequences of my sin and he's going to discipline me and it's going to hurt. So what God is saying, repent, stop right now. 
right? So when I find myself in, you know, going down a sinful path, it's God saying, stop right now, repent of your sin, move in another direction, cut it off. And that's what I have to do because if I go and I live in that sin, Hebrews 12 says, as a believer, the Lord's going to chase me and it's going to hurt, right? I don't, I don't want to feel that way again because I've been there, right? It does hurt. And, 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 and so I think as believers, we've got to take God's word, internalize it and apply it to our lives. But, but men and women have to be taught how to do that, you know? And so that's why you need a good, not only do you need accountability, you need a mentor. And I have a couple. Um, that, you know, when I don't understand a passage of scripture, I go and say, help, help me. I don't understand this. Like, what do you, what do you think this means? You know, and, and, and so really, you know, looking at that. So I think, you know, having a mentor is very, very important mentors to help you understand God's word so that you can apply it to your life. Mm-hmm. Then it really begins to change you. So I, I got, I'm going to try to land the plane cause we are going long. Yeah. Um, so two, two more main questions and one follow-up question. So, uh, if the statistics in this are right, which I think that they're, if they're not exactly right, they're real close. Um, then there are people that will hear this that are struggling in this area, whether it be through infidelity or pornography or visualization or whatever the case may be. Um, what stops them from getting healing is often the deep shame that mm-hmm. they feel because of the nature of the sin. And you're talking about confession yeah, and then accountability and then, you know, pay, paying the price for the sin, right? Confessing it to your spouse, dealing with the ramifications of that. And that's going to scare a whole bunch of people away. So how can they start in a way that is safe? Like, what would you tell someone who is like, man, I really want help, but I'm scared of the process. How would you suggest that they start? Exactly what I did in September of 2014, which is before I confessed uh, to my wife in 2014, you know, uh, what I had been struggling with. I went and saw Dr. Ellis. Got a, I got a, went to a good marriage, Christian marriage counselor. Now, there's different types of marriage counselors, and I like biblical counselors, um, that, you know, aren't going to give me necessarily a bunch of books to read, but are going to take me into God's word. And there's nothing wrong with books, but really biblical based counseling. And when I found Steve, you know, he helped me unpack what I was feeling and figure out how to, you know, re- essentially repent of my sin and, and, and how to do it and the way to do it. And, um, and, and I was able to go, it was a safe space because, you know, the thing about having a, a Christian counselor is, you know, by law, your, your information's confidential. Right. And it wasn't a pastor. It wasn't anybody in my church I went to. I went to a Christian marriage counselor and invested and poured out my story. And I felt safe there. So you found a neutral locked box. Yeah. And yeah. you screamed in the middle of it. Yeah. And I felt completely safe knowing that nothing was going to leave that building. Right. And I outed myself completely. And by the way, it's liberating to go to, you talk about freedom. Go to a marriage counselor if you're struggling with, with this stuff, even if you're having a wrong relationship, your infidelity, fornication pornography, you name the addiction, right? And go to a marriage and just let it out of the box and you'll walk out feeling completely different. It's like, wow, my sin is out there. Somebody knows about it. Okay. Then you get the help on how to tackle that. And a good marriage counselor is going to help you walk through that to say, you know, this is really a sin that you need to do this. And this is how you, you need to do this and how you need to go about doing this. And, you know, once you get that advice and you execute that plan, you always have that counselor as your safety net. So even when I confessed my sin and things weren't good in my marriage, again, right, I spent every week in Dr. Ellis's office and it was like, I couldn't wait to get there because it was like, all right, let me tell you about my week. What should I do from here? Like, what do I do from here? Like, help me, you know, and every week I just had that safety net and, you know, and it, it really, really helped me navigate through some tough times. And it was somebody that I could trust. And ultimately, you know, my spouse was then brought into that process Mm -hmm. with that counselor. And we were able to find more healing. Um, but for me, the, uh, you know, especially pornography, guys, it's a secret, secret sin. You know, people are scared because they're really worried about what other people would think if they found out. Mm-hmm. You know, here I am, right? I mean, on a, on a podcast outing myself. And, you know, and, I, and I've been doing that. And to me, this, even this podcast is a great source of accountability for me because now I really have to live it, Ryan. Right? I it's mean, out there. It's out there now, right? So, yeah. you know, I think what I have found for me is that, you know, 
even when I mentor other men, like it's just as good for me as it is for them. You know, I get just as much out of it, but, but yeah, I would say that that's, that's where you go. First place to start, you know, for me, that's my opinion. That's what I found really worked for me. Okay. So, uh, with, with, uh, pornography being as widespread as it is in today's world, how would you suggest people parent differently than they have in past generations? So, you know, I talk to people all the time who don't want to shelter, quote, shelter their kids. Um, I, I'm completely in the opposite camp. I'm like, I'm all about sheltering. And here's what I mean by that. You know, my children don't have access to any kind of internet, don't even have access to YouTube. Like, I don't even want soft porn in there. And my kids don't know anything different. So my son's 15, and yes, he, he has an Xbox, but he has no access to the web on the Xbox. I have to approve all of his games. Okay, so, you know, he, he's... He doesn't ever surf the internet, and he's 15. Okay, could he? Yeah, I mean, I'm sure. You know, every once in a while, you know, he'll get on my phone and Google, you know, a new rifle that he wants at Cabela's or something like that, right? But he doesn't know anything different. And same with my daughter Gabby, and you know, and my five-year-old. So we've locked down, you know, the access to the internet in the home with all the devices. And we're we're not naive as parents. Like we're always look, we're smart enough to look for workarounds, right? So we're checking. Do they have other ways, other apps? other things in their phone, we inspect, you know, often mm -hmm. we'll just take my daughter's phone and inspect every once in a while and just pull it and look at it, read the text messages. Right. And just, and just be like, dad, what are you doing? If you don't have anything to hide, you don't care if I look. So there has to be an inspection process. And I understand fully that when they go to college and they get out there that, you know, they're going to, they're going to be some eye opening moments and they're going to have to make decisions, but I don't want them while their, their frontal lobes are still developing where they can't, they're not capable of making good decisions at this point. A lot of them are, Okay, to give them, to allow them and trust them enough to go out and, you know, have access to that kind of information, or that kind of sin. And, you know, so again, there's other parenting philosophies that would say, well, I want them to kind of get exposure to that now. So when they get out of the house, they know how to handle that better. I don't subscribe to that parenting philosophy, but that's just, that's just me. So um, as we come to a close, there's all these people out there that are probably struggling in their own mess. Yeah. Um, so you gave them some, some resources, some ideas, um, you know, to go to a Christian counselor, but would you honor us and close us in prayer and pray for those people who are maybe struggling in their own, uh, you know, sexual sin? Absolutely. Lord, we love you. Just thank you for this time to come to you. And, and Lord, you know, my life uh, at the age of 43, father, I have, uh, been yours for the last 10 years, and, and Lord certainly have not lived a perfect 10 years by any stretch of the means. It's been uh, a battle uh, up and down and, and that we all face, and and Lord, I still believe I'm in recovery. And um, you, know, you know, for all these years, I don't ever want to get to a point where I feel like I've overcome um, you know, sexual sin, Lord, of any kind, and I fully realize that m my capability of falling back into it, and, and God, you've been so gracious and shown me a lot of mercy. And, um, and Lord, with the safeguards in my own life. And, and Father, you brought you know, people to me, and I, I praise you for that. And God, I can pray you continue to use me, use Ryan, use this ministry here, Miracle Hill, Lord, is working with people. We think of the audience, Lord, listening now, where you know, they're, maybe they're in a situation where they don't know what to do. God, I just pray that you would move um, in their lives and their hearts. If they're not, uh, they don't belong to you, God, that they would be convicted of their sin. Lord, and, and seek to repent and seek you, Lord, and give their lives to you. First and foremost, to overcome this addiction is to, to become a believer and to give their life and surrender completely to you, Lord. And Lord, they can do that just listening to this podcast and just saying, Lord, I repent. I call on your name right now. I know you, Jesus, you died for me. Mm. God, I, I know you raised him from the dead on the third day. And Lord, I don't want to, I don't want to live this way anymore. I don't want to have this pornography addiction. I don't want to live in this relationship. Teach me what to do, Lord. Guide me. Save me from my sin, Lord. I repent. I don't want it anymore. And, you know, God, that type of calling out in your name and repenting and turning is the first step, Lord, into this road of recovery. And for those that are true believers that are battling with this sin, Lord, I just pray they're listening to this. Uh, God, it's just a matter of time, especially if they're married, where the pornography will ruin the marriage or another relationship will ruin the marriage. And, and so, God, we just pray um, that you would convict them or to get the help that they need. Maybe it is a pastor at the church that they trust. Maybe it is a friend, a good Christian friend who's strong and solid that, that they go and they just let this out. But Lord, there has to be some mode of confession to start that process of recovery, whether it's an independent, you know, neutral Christian counselor or a church uh, pastor, Lord, or a friend or family member, somebody that they can trust. 
Lord, it has to come out. Otherwise, it's a secret that will continue if they're a believer, and it will continue to eat at them until, A, it's either discovered, Lord, um, uh, Lord, or until it destroys their lives hmm. and, uh, and their marriages. So, God, we just pray, Lord, that uh, for those believers that are listening, God, that they would, would repent and, and, and find that person that they can connect with and seek the road to recovery. And, Lord, I think the scary thing for all of us, and including this for me, is the pride. God, a lot of the times the reason what keeps us from confessing the things that we struggle with when it relates to sexual sin is our pride. We don't want people to think bad of us. We, we don't want people to think, you know, we, we want people to think that, they're, that we're good people. And so, you know, we struggle with humility. And that's the reason why we hold on to our secret sins. And Father, I just pray that you would humble us now and that we would open up and share and get rid of that pride and break us, Lord, so that we can confess that sin. So Lord, we pray that this podcast would reach those, Lord, that, that need to t- turn their life around and uh, God, that they would give their lives to you and, and certainly repent. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Man, thanks so much for coming on. Thanks for sharing your story yeah, and, and uh, giving some hope to people out there who might be struggling on this important topic. Happy to do it. Thanks for having me. Mm-hmm. Bye, everybody.